you are listening to the Essie Rat Pack Podcast. Uh, Shane Adams, your host, along with Patrick Rollins. And uh, today's Patrick's birthday. Yay! <laughs> so he's 29 holding, like all the rest of us. Uh, so what are we talking about today, Patrick? Uh, we're going to talk about the jungle. The jungle. The, uh, and the importance of the jungle and our, and, uh, our time in the jungle yep. to our company, for sure. Uh, real quick, we are going to be putting this on uh, YouTube as well. So along or aside from um, our, our normal audio podcast, we're going to be putting this up on YouTube. And we're also going to be dropping in some pictures from yeah. from some trips over the years. Thanks to Patrick and Mike Molner and Ruben Bollier for uh, their contribution to those photos. So if you want to check out the photos and uh, a little more visual on some stuff, then that's going to be a good place to see it. Uh, I know we have, so let's talk real quick about jungle trips been a big trip that we do every year. Yeah. And then the last couple of years we haven't done it. Why is that? So it got to where it was hit or miss, you know, the, the class itself can be considered pricey, but not for what you're getting. You know, it's $1,400, you know, for the class for the six day jungle survival on Amazon. Um, airfare started climbing and climbing and climbing. When we used to start, when we used to go to that class, airfare was dirt cheap. Yeah, I, I was never in on it when it was dirt cheap. Uh, but Jeff and Mike have told me that they used to be able to fly a round trip down to you know Aikidos for four or five hundred dollars. Wow! And then my first trip was in 2011, I think. And by then it was nine hundred thousand dollars. And then like the last time. I went down was in 2017, and it was about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars yeah. you know, for round trip down there. So, so essentially doubling the cost yeah. of the class. Yeah. yeah. So we had that to where the airfare climbed quite a mm-hmm. bit, and then we also had COVID. Yeah. Uh, and then getting accurate information mm-hmm. from uh, anyone down there yeah. uh, would be difficult. Um, <clears throat> so we have put that class back up on the books. Yep. Uh, for October 15th through the 20th, and that is a six-day class. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts if you plan on or are interested in coming to that okay. class. Yeah, and that's October 15th through the 20th of next year, 2023. Right, Not right. This year. So we got plenty of time. Yeah. Um, stuff I would suggest, um, I've been to the jungle overweight, and I've been to the jungle in decent shape, and it's a whole lot easier uh, without extra pounds on you. Um Heat and humidity down there is maybe just a little bit more than Alabama, Georgia. Just you know, a touch. Just a touch. A little bit, you know, similar. That's but, hard to believe. Yeah. Coming from a class we had just this past weekend yeah. where I was looked like I'd been dipped in a pool mm. uh, just sitting in the classroom. Yeah. Um, you know, weather-wise, you know, it's a rain rainforest. So Damn. even in the dry season, you're going to get rain <clears> on. Uh, just not all day. Um now, do we go normally in their dry season or their wet season? Or? We've done it both. Um, I, I get them mixed up, which is which. You know, we usually go like in March or October, like in March, April or October. And one's the rainy season and one isn't. I, I don't remember because it you still get rained on. You know, both You're times. wet the whole time anyway, whether it's wet, raining or not. Wet the whole time. Um, where they have us uh, beat hands down is insects. You know, here in Georgia, Alabama, even in the hottest, muggiest part of the summer, if you're hiking, moving through the woods, and you need to take a break, you can, you can sit on the ground, you know. But down there, it's very seldom you're going to find somewhere where you could sit down and just rest for you know 10, 15 minutes and not have bugs crawling all over you. That's uh, it seems like everything in the jungle, uh, from the plants to the animals to the insects, wants to kill you and eat you. I, it can seem that way. Yeah, that's uh, just my. I, I've never been, <laughs> so I'm asking yeah. all these questions. Uh, real quick on a logistics <laughs> standpoint. This is a six-day class. Yeah. How many days do you recommend taking? To- if we got to talk about getting off work, what are we talking about total time investment? I would, you know, I would try to get ten days, you know, and have the six-day trip sandwiched on either end by a couple of days. Uh, you definitely don't want to fly back home from the Amazon and go to work the next day because you're still covered up with mosquito bites and. And you know, place cuts and or briars have gotten in stuff like that, and could potentially bring back a little parasite or a bug or something yeah, too if you're not yeah. careful. Um, so gear wise, this is a pretty limited experience. Yeah, Jeff and Mike started this class and started taking the clients down there as a downed pilot course, 
and a lot of the students, are, and I think they even had a couple of contract um, gigs where they were teaching pilots. And it's basically what to do, you know, if your plane goes down. I think there were some aerial survey te teams coming down there, and uh, they were getting the training. So you're allowed what a pilot would have, like, in his survival vest. Um, so you can have a fixed blade knife. You can have personal first aid kit. You can have a small fishing kit, um, compass, uh, ranger beads, um, a poncho, or a tarp. Oh, well, we like teaching or you know, getting Percy to help show also uh, how to weave the palm prawns to make the roof for your swamp bed. Um, but we're not always in a good area for that, so we do allow them to bring like a you know military poncho or a you know lightweight backpacking tarp. Um, you allow a mosquito net. And you definitely want to have that. Um, that's about it. We, we buy machetes there. You know, you'll go, we'll stop one of the little hardware stores, and you won't believe the racks and racks of machetes. And they're, they're good, you know, good machetes, tramontinas and stuff like that, all different, you know, sizes, and they're cheap. So the cheap machete is really the the fixed blade of choice that's, down there. Yeah, that's, that's the way to go down there. And um, that's really about it. I would recommend quick drying clothes. They're never really going to completely dry out. <laughs> Uh, so some type of jungle boots. Um, I like the all time on the military mm -hmm. surplus um, jungle boot. Um, it's been in service for 50 years or so, and it's it's tough and, and drains water well. Um, that's about it. Uh, med kit, personal support kit, as yeah. far as you bring your own medication, something yeah. to support yeah. blisters or treat blisters or or chafing yeah which is something that you get a little monkey butt down oh, yeah. there from what i hear it's easy easy to do um yeah just any essential the first aid stuff you might need uh we always have a medic it's usually a paramedic or emt that we invited to come to the class mm -hmm. uh, and be the medic for the trip and and they'll be carrying you know a much more extensive you know first aid kit but so um this is just a a personal footnote here is I'm bringing a, a tub of brave soldier. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if uh, this is no affiliation with our podcast, but uh, as a you know, lifelong cyclist, uh, we are pretty familiar with chafing and monkey butt at times, especially if you start doing endurance rides. Um, monkey butt is a term of endearment <laughs> and it is exactly what it sounds like. If you ever picture a baboon with a rosy red rear end, that's kind of what it feels like at times. Uh, if you're looking for a antiseptic healing ointment, uh, Brave Soldier is absolutely one of my favorite items. Uh, no affiliation with the podcast. That's just a free. I've heard a lot of good stuff. Man, that stuff works for bug bite stings. Has some topical lidocaine in it, and uh, that's one of my. I'll just be bathing in that stuff. So one one question I get asked a lot is uh, shots. What, what kind of shots do I need to get? You know, inoculations. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, before going down there, and before my first trip. I asked uh, Jeff what he recommended, and he said him, him and Mike got shots the first time they went down there, you know, back in the late 90s, and never did it again. It's, it's not in a bad area where there's, you know, a lot going on that you have to be concerned about as far as that. So I've, I've never gotten any, you know, shots prior to going. Right. Do what works for you yeah. on that. Uh, so let's talk about the area we're in um, and a little bit about the schedule. Uh, from my understanding is the trip pretty much the schedule ends when you touch down yeah. in the last <laughs> airport right and then I've, everything else yeah. from then is just part um, of the class yeah um so we'll fly to lima uh, big peru. Inter lima peru big <clears throat> international airport and from there we take about another hour flight to Iquitos. Uh it's a third world big city uh you know, I encourage you to look it up, you know, any of these towns or anything, look them up on uh, Google and see pictures and, and stuff like that. Um, from there. I think you said probably the most dangerous place is Iquitos. Uh, that's where I. Yeah. But not for the reasons you might think. It's the rickshaws and oh, the yeah. taxi. Yeah, probably the, uh, the most dangerous thing you do the whole the whole class is just getting to and from the airport and the on the rickshaw taxis. Um, just try you know, it's, it's third world if you've never experienced it um, it's definitely an eye-opener uh, just seeing you know what they consider just everyday life you know just normal 
But um, Percy will have him and some of his guide. Percy Yakamena is our, our main guide that we use. Uh, and so we're down there using. We're, I mean, we're teaching, but yeah. these guys we're these guys are really doing more of the teaching. These yeah, these guys um, be very difficult to do one of these classes without them because they. You know, if we need something, they can get it. You know, they can line up uh, transport, you know, on the you know, boats, and they get fuel. Our and, guide uh, slash fixer. <clears throat> yeah. And um, so part of your tuition when you pay for the class, you know, a good portion of it goes to pay those guys, pay mm-hmm. Percy, and then him pay his assistants. But they'll meet us at the airport in Iquitos and then get us all marshaled to a whatever hotel we're staying in. And keep in mind, it's third world ho- hotel, so... Uh, just be prepared not to expect continental okay. breakfast yeah <laughs> and then uh from there you know we'll, we'll go out to dinner and discuss what we're going to be doing the next six days and then the next morning we all get on a boat and go for about a nine hour boat ride up the amazon which is also one of the more interesting parts That's part of the experience right. um one one class we didn't have a whole lot of students and we just took, they have what they call speed boats, which is just a smaller boat that goes a lot faster. And um, it just wasn't the same. You know, it was like a two hour trip instead of a nine hour right. trip. Mm-hmm. And that needs to be part of the class. The, the apocalypse now feel to it where you're just going way up river. Yeah. yeah. And like in the movie, they tell you, uh, don't ever get off the boat. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, from there we go up to. Percy has property on the Tawayo River, which is a tributary off the Amazon. And um, and the, the rivers down there are like our interstate systems. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Amazon's like I-75 as far as boat traffic. People going to and from places and fishing and going about their lives. Um, once we get to Percy's property, that's where we get into the instruction. We get some land nav instruction. Now, there's no PowerPoints because there's no power. But we'll do, you know, land nav, um, knife and machete safety and use. If you need a land knife primer, we also have, I mean, we have a land knife class, but even aside from that, our land nav curriculum is available on our website yep. on that class link for free. Yep. So that's to anybody that wants to learn about the basics of land nav. It's there. I would I would definitely, if you intend to, to take the jungle class, study up on that. Because you can only do so much without the visual of a PowerPoint. And uh, we'll have maps and compasses, and, and we'll really you know, do the instruction, but you can get a lot more out of it looking at the PowerPoint, too. So one of the things that I'm uh, – so I, I land nav. I, I'm okay with land nav, but I know I land nav mostly here in North Georgia and every place I've been, whether it be out west or somewhere else, but mostly by terrain association. I look at the map and look at where I am based on elevation features. The problem that I see with, with the Amazon, there is no elevation, and you can't see. Can't see, uh, no elevation. It's flat. And uh, everything's green. And so, other things you might use for handrails and backstops, like rivers or anything else, can be, you know, hundreds of meters, if not oh, yeah. miles, out of the banks, depending on the water level. Oh yeah. Um, depending on you know which one is the rainy season, um, you know, like you look on your GPS, and you know you're in the boat on the river, and you look at your GPS, and it's showing you. Uh, couple hundred meters off the amazon and uh you're still on it it's just swelled you know yeah, what I mean? it's, it's just flooded a bunch and, and um but yeah after all that instruction you know there at percy's um we just strike out into the jungle for the rest of the class and you know traveling navigating through the jungle um instruction in the afternoons on how to build a swamp bed different traps snares um you know, Percy and his guys will, will teach and show edible and useful plants because they, they know that. I don't, I don't remember the first thing about edible plants hardly down there. Um, so they're great in that aspect and, and talking about the animals and insects and what they call them and what they're useful for and all that. And then um, spend the rest of the class out there learning and navigate through the jungle and then come out at the end. So uh, what and when do you eat? Um, you know, it's a survival class, uh, and if you've been or heard anything about our survival classes, we we want a little bit of suffering uh, in there, and don't let this put you off if you're thinking about taking the class. It's part of it. So, usually don't eat anything the first two days, and then by day three, we'll try to be somewhere where they can get some, some fishing lines in the water, 
uh, get some traps built and stuff like that. And if it's just not happening, I can always get Percy or his guys to go. You know, Percy, we got to we got to feed these guys something today. They're getting a little too run down, and then he he'll take off, come back a couple hours later with something. So, how do you like your piranha prepared? Uh, piranha's good. Um, basically, you just gut it, cut some slits in the side, and throw it on a swamp grill, and I uh, started taking a red-eyed hog uh, down there seasoning. That helps um, everything. Yeah, put that on everything. Um, what are some of the more interesting items that you've eaten? I know we've got some photos of a lot of different yeah. uh, local delicacies. <laughs> so piranhas, um, sloths. Sloths are real easy for Percy and his guys to catch. Uh, we've been going down the river in the boat, and one of his guys spot one, and the driver of the boat go over to the bank. One of Percy's guys just shimmy up the tree and uh, just get a hold of it by the, the back of the neck and, and pry it loose and – Take it with us. Um, anaconda. Um, caiman. I, I haven't had caiman. Okay. I haven't had, well, I take that back. Um, I had some caiman that Percy's wife had cooked. You know, she made dinner for all of us one night before we went into the, the jungle. And uh, But I haven't had it out there in the jungle. In the jungle. Um, I know Jeff and Mike have eaten all kinds of stuff. I've never had monkey, you know, when they have. Yeah. And, so, uh, Surrey grubs, I think they're called. Yeah. You know, like we have the wood grubs here. Imagine one bigger and fatter. Wow. Uh, and it's, it's good. I mean, you're not going to eat what you're used to, and there's not going to be as much as you're used to. Right. And so, over the course of the six days, you know, it's a, it's a good weight loss program. Yeah. Um, uh, but by the end, it makes, it makes everything at the end of it you appreciate it so much more mm -hmm. getting a shower you know you're wearing the same clothes socks funky boots in the jungle for six days um food it makes you appreciate just going back to and eating regularly you know and sleeping in a bed instead of a swamp bed it just it's a, it's a good lesson I, a lot of people take that class ruben and i have talked about it like getting a hole punched in their man card you know i've seen wide range of students from former military to you know contractors to accountants uh physician assistant you know just and just normal folks that take it and one of our you know mike that you mentioned moner um he's all about showing his friends all the crazy stuff he does yeah yeah and so the pictures and the being there and the experience and then being able to come back and tell your buddies and show them what you did and tell the stories you know, that's a big draw. For a Which is a uh, Moner's oh, exceptional yeah. at his oh, storytelling. Yeah. Uh, all, all cannon fodder for him. Oh, yeah. So, so what it sounds like is that it's very similar. How would you compare it to our, like compare and contrast a little bit, this class to our field survival class? Um, Aside from being on a different continent. As far as level of difficulty, close, but for different reasons, mm -hmm. you know, field survival, we sleep deprive you. You don't get to eat much. PT the crap you, you out get of you. PT left and right to really run you down, get you physically tired. We make you do the team building stuff and all that. In, in the jungle, we don't do any of that. We you don't have to. Don't have to. Uh, it's dark from six o'clock at night till six in the morning because we're on the equator, and so that's six hours of laying there. You know, we we don't keep you up awake at night or nothing like that. No PT. Uh, the jungle does the job for us. Just the, the jungle does all the heavy lifting yeah. on this. And the whole point of that, even like within field survival, we've said this before, is the whole point of that is to force you to work in a stressed mm -hmm. environment. Uh, we can't crash you in a plane, but what we can do is we can make you immediately uncomfortable mm -hmm. and immediately tired, or at least very close to being yeah. tired. Um, and, and I would say to go back to the physical fitness, like in the, in field survival, you don't want, you don't have to be in the best shape, but you don't want to be in the guy in the worst shape. Mm -hmm. Um, and this would fall into that as well. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, you know, I, I love the, like, I, 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 I'm very intrigued, uh, by the jungle class and I've never been. So it's something I've wanted to go just so I could, I mean, I'm the only person in the company at this point that really hasn't gone as far as, well, Bruce hadn't gone. Bruce won't go. <laughs> I don't, Bruce, Bruce, uh, come on down, Bruce. We'll, we'll bring you with us. Uh, to be very, very honest, the thing that drives, like I've got sweet blood. Like if we stand outside 
if I stand next to my wife somewhere outside, if I go on my back porch at dusk, we could stand out here together and I get bit 15 but, times more than she does. So that's the part where, uh, you know, we watch all these naked and afraid <laughs> shows and all these people and I see all that. I was like, that would be me. Yeah. I would be the guy that looks like a, a topographic map. You'll, now. You'll, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you'll like, enjoy it. So that's the part where I'm like, you'll, I can, I can imagine at some point a cuss fit from oh, yeah. just like, <laughs> can't take it anymore. Just can't take it anymore. <laughs> uh, Go back to gear real quick, and we we specialize. You know, we, we you specified a fixed blade knife. Uh, what's the your chosen knife, or what would you? Because people are going to ask, what knife do we bring? Or I mean, I've what, taken just about everything you can think of down there, and then it really doesn't have to be a fixed blade knife. I mean, you can get by with a Swiss, Swiss Army, Army knife, knife and, a, and a machete down there. Yeah, um, and those guys, the ones that you know live it every day, I've seen them clean uh, a chicken in there or a pir- piranha in there hand with a machete yeah it's by choking up on it holding the back of it and so they don't even carry the pocket knives or fixed blade they just it's all machetes everything machete. yeah so <coughs> one so that that brings me up to another i know that i personally when i respond to people online may seem to have a bit of a cavalier <laughs> attitude uh or maybe even um dismissive attitude about surface rust on a knife Mm. and and one of the things that that i like to say is this company was built on the floor of the amazon Mm. jungle Uh, and and one of the things that i I don't i'm not sure if a lot of people know is the importance of the history to this class or to our to our company we were uh jeff and mike were down there training people in south america long before we were in the knife business and and um so when people uh, lament or or complain about a carbon steel knife rusting, mm-hmm. or, or worry about it. <laughs> we have a very, yeah. I mean, like very cavalier attitude towards yeah. that. Um, is your knife going to rust down there? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah first yeah. day. Yeah, uh, I think one of the pictures that I sent um, that was a brand new three HM when they first came out, and that picture is probably on day four or five. And you can see the logo along the edge. Just rust it. Yeah, and just, if so, you know, who cares? <laughs> yeah, just use it. Use it. Clean it up when you get back, you know. So um, there's so much that's ingrained in our company based on our experiences mm-hmm. uh, in the jungle. Jeff and Mike couldn't find tools that they liked, knives, mm-hmm. specifically knives, Uh so they started designing their own knives. Mm-hmm. They started having uh, <coughs> local makers or small custom makers mm-hmm. design, and they just really wanted <coughs> really simple tools, simple knives mm-hmm. that could take abuse. Um, so we started with very simple designs that worked. Yep. I love to say we we make ugly knives that work. <laughs> uh, LT, Kahuta, all those guys. There, there's tons of people that make pretty knives, and they work as well. Yeah. But we were, I think we're kind of like the Glock of knives. Yeah. We're just nothing special about us. We just we know what we do. Um, and even to the point of where, so before I came on staff, I was an SE dealer, uh, in a bike shop. I had SE knives in my bike shop and I can remember that the debut of the venom green and the oranges and all that stuff kind of coincided with the zombie apocalypse movement. Uh, what was that born out of? I think, uh, you know, it was all around the time where walking dead was on TV and was getting real popular and all that. And then you started seeing a lot of these zombie colors. I think the first run, if I remember correctly, Jeff told me it was uh, just like a, sh- a small batch short run, just because people on the forums were asking for it or whatever. And then it did so well, they just you know started doing it. Um, the main thing and that a lot of people will purchase those for, um, because if you drop it or lay it down in grass or weeds or in the woods or jungle or whatever, you can see it. You know, help you find it. So uh, we sent John Armstrong down there, who is the designer of the Libertariat, mm-hmm. to get photos and marketing collateral. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, the jungle ate his knife. Like the only prototype yep. we had lost it in the first twenty four hours. Yep. So it was our first day in the first day in, in the jungle. So the jungle, that's what we say, the jungle eats things. Uh, And uh, I think you have, when you go down there, you have a machete tree. Yeah, we'll designate a tree there wherever we're setting up camp or building the swamp beds. And everybody stick, uh, when they're not using it, stick the machete 
point in the in the ground with the edge facing the tree and then so it's secure stuck in the ground and then lean lean against, against the tree with the edge facing the tree and they're all in one spot yeah th- and that way they're not sticking out of a log here laying on the ground here because um, you can't see the, like the footing everything just kind of blends yeah, in so you don't uh, want to have somebody step on a machete um, we don't we don't carry the machetes you don't see machete sheaths down there um, you don't see any of the, the locals using them um, and Jeff told me that the reason that it is is because we had a machete on your side in a sheath hanging from your belt and you like stepped off a log or slipped or something fell the you know the point going into the ground the handle could break a rib mm-hmm. um so we just use the machete tree <laughs> that was my dog making <laughs> weird noises in there um one thing um people are concerned about before going down there and rightly so is taking care of your feet mm-hmm. you'll see in the, in the pictures there's some some ugly looking wrinkled up feet uh, one of them's mine, one of them's Ruben's. Uh, Pruned. Yeah, your, your feet stay soaking wet um, the whole time you're there. So it's very important at night when you're crawling into your swamp bed, get your boots off, get your socks off, wipe off as much excess water off your feet as you can. And Ruben gave me a tip before my first trip, and it's hand sanitizer. Just rub your feet down with hand sanitizer. Alcohol. Alcohol pulls the moisture out. But in the morning, feet are fine. And then you go put those soaking wet socks and boots back on. Ruben's full of jungle oh, yeah. knowledge, man. Yeah. And I think he's getting set up and ready to go to uh, the Philippines or Malaysia. Or... Um, not sure. Yeah, he's about to head into yeah. the jungle in a couple Heading weeks. somewhere. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the culture and the people down there. So. Um, just very welcoming. Um, my first trip down there, I hadn't, you didn't really know what to expect. Everybody's laid back. Um, like you were talking about when you step off the plane that's when you have to learn how to relax and things don't always go as planned or on time you know um, like even the boat ride going up the Amazon I'll ask Percy how much further he's like "Uh, maybe one more hour when in truth it ends up being like four or five more hours you know so they they just look at things differently they don't get uptight and in a hurry over you know schedules and, and stuff like that as far as being concerned about people, um, I usually don't fully relax until we're out of Aikido's because it's a big city. You know, I don't yeah. like I don't like being in big cities here. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then, um, once we get in the jungle, never had any problems other than you know maybe one of the locals stealing something uh, from a backpack or something like that. Some funny stories about stuff going missing and then. Uh, offering a reward and it's showing back up yeah they'll show back you know later in the day they'll show up and say oh so and so had this and i knew it was yours so i brought it back and it's you know an economy of desperation um not saying they're 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 bad people but you know just trying to get by you know it's stuff you you don't see that here you know somebody doesn't break into your house and then bring something back to you and say you know i found this my buddy had it you know hope for a reward um but for the most part just good folks man i, I just um so, so much of our, so much of this company is built on that. I, I can remember seeing images that Jeff, I mean, Jeff's a phenomenal photographer, but I, I just, so many images of the people down there just yeah. are, that to me is one of the draws is just, I'm not a global traveler. I haven't been to a whole bunch of places. And so to go into a different environment like that is mm-hmm. something that to me is, is part of the adventure is, is of getting it. In, yeah. in getting immersed in a different culture. And mm-hmm. it's not like we blend in down no. there either. No, so, so as soon as you show up and hop off the, whatever it is you're riding yeah. in, people know you're not from around oh, there. Yeah. They, uh, most of them have a good sense of humor. They're all the time laughing and cutting up with each other. And, and so don't, you know, if you go, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, don't go down there thinking this is a uh, like a military class so don't you know have camouflage and 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 carry yourself you know like or like a sense of importance or anything like mm-hmm. that just go to to learn and have a good time because you know the person is guys they'll they'll pick at you and cut up with you and, and just be able to to laugh you know just well i think uh anytime jeff always talk jeff or mike either one talk about uh or reuben especially and you uh you guys talk about the importance of having a sense of humor mm-hmm. and being able to make fun of yourself mm-hmm. and how that lightens the mood and it lets them kind of accept you a little better. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. If they see that you can, you know, be a little like, oh, yeah. you know, Jeff being a little goofy down there, <laughs> Mike singing or doing that, something. Yeah. Dancing or singing Dancing. A song. Um, that breaks, that's a great way to break the tension oh, yeah. and kind of and uh, set the tone for, for who you are and introduce yourself despite the language difficulty. Yeah. Speaking of language difficulty, uh, what, are we, what are we speaking? Spanish. Spanish and... Um, I, you know, a great portion of them speak English also, uh, Proven's down there where we go. Um, uh, you know, Percy, of course, speaks English and his guys speak enough English to you, you can make your, your intent known. You can communicate, yeah. yeah. Um... An item that you always carry that people may not think about? Um, I like having a bandana down there. Don't carry one a whole lot, you know, here in the States, but down there, just because uh, you're always getting muddy and nasty and just having something you can dip in the river and put on your neck to help cool you down. Help cool off. Yeah, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, Everybody's probably dying to know about bullet ants. Oh well, yeah. I mean, there's so many. I mean, the kangaroo, the bull. Yeah. I mean, the bullet, the azula. There's oh, yeah. so many of. Uh, what's your What's your least favorite insect down there? Um, there's there's so many to choose from. <laughs> I've only been stung by an azula once, and that was my first trip down there. Ruben and I were we were the whole class. We we're moving to a swamp, um, maybe knee deep and flooded area, and all of a sudden I felt like I got shot in the back of the le- uh, left thigh with a twenty two, and I just brushed at it. And then I'm, Ruben and I looked, and there's an inch-long black ant basically walking on water, swimming, going towards Ruben, and it wound up getting him too. So we're laughing. I mean, we, yeah, you know, terrible pain. Yeah. Um, on the, uh, I think it's called the, the Schmidt, Schmidt Sting Pain Index Scale. Um, the guy who did all this research went around getting bit and stung by all, all the insects, and the Azula is number one. Well, uh, I think Steve Ranella on Meat Eater Podcast yeah. talks about getting hit by one yeah. down there about, uh, what's about eight or nine hours? Uh, about 12. Um, for me, you know, that was about 10 o'clock in the morning when that happened. And I was laying in the swamp bed and all of a sudden, you know, it was just constant pain throbbing, you know, for the 10, you know, 10 12 hours and then just quit, you know, and. That was just a huge relief, but it was, you know, it was funny. You know, we laughed about it, and <laughs> and Percy and his guys, let Jeff and Mike laughed at us, and you know, it's just part of it. I wouldn't put it past Jeff or Mike to throw it on you. Um, they, it's a plant. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past them. Uh, but that's the only time. You know, I've been there five times, and that's the only time I've ever been stung by one. Poisonous snakes down there. I see. I see more snakes here than I do down there. Uh, we're in a group, you know, so a big group. It's like here, if you're in a group hiking through the woods, the snake fills the vibrations. Here's you coming a long time before you ever get there. From there. And um, so down there, I've, as far as snakes that I spotted that wasn't pointed out, you know, by Percy or one of his guys, I've seen maybe two. I don't know what they were. You know, yeah. just catch a tail going under some, you know, brush or yeah. something. Um but you know the yeah, other some there's some very deadly snakes down there. That's why we use you know guides that are from there that spend ninety percent of their time in the jungle um, because they they'll see stuff before we do. Yeah, uh, they can instantly know how bad it is. You know if it you know how poisonous it is. You know that kind of thing. So I I, I would have to so Jackson, my oldest son, has what we've always called a phenomenal game eye. I mean, like he can spot wildlife. Mm-hmm. Uh, before anybody any of any of us can by a long shot i would imagine that's a different type of game eye down there oh, yeah. as, as far as developing you know you can be a hunter here and and pick up movement or something like that a, you know turkey hunting's a perfect example where you're looking for <coughs> movement at ground level almost a long ways off um down there you just can't see that far no way. it's it's everything's so green and just blends together um percy can sm- you know smell snakes um I believe him because, you know, some snakes here kind of have a musky odor. Mm-hmm. You know, imagine... I've always heard you can smell rattlesnakes. Yeah. Um, imagine a much larger snake is going to smell even more. Yeah. And uh, so we've been traveling through the jungle, and, and Percy stopped and say, I smell a snake. And so he would go off to look for it, and we would just continue. And then we'd, he would know where we're going to be setting up. And a couple hours later, he'd come walking into camp with a big, you know, nine-foot boa or anaconda or whatever <laughs> uh jackson and parker riding motorcycles up in the cajutas and uh last weekend they're like i smell a bear and then they went around the corner and 
Yeah. Were, you know, so I thought that was funny. Mm-hmm. Um, dangerous plants? Um, All of them? Everything has spines on it? A lot of spines. Black palm. Um, you'll see in one of the photos uh, a log on the ground with some big, long thorns sticking out of it. Gnarly. Very, very dangerous. Um, that's the one that's like a burn almost, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Jeff had a, um, a tip of one break off in his hand one of the trips, and I think he had to have it had to have the, uh, the splinter removed surgically, surgically when he got back. Um, it's, you know, and, and that stuff, you'll see full-size trees floating down the Amazon. You know, mm-hmm. you just, the, the size of it's really just amazing. And that's why you got to be careful as far as, you know, we wouldn't let anybody just dive off the boat right. into the water because, you know, you don't know what's right under the surface. It might be one of those black palm logs a foot under the surface and yeah. you can't see it. The water's know? murky. It's yeah. not. It's, it looks like, you know, chocolate milk. Yeah. So One of my favorite stories that Jeff likes to tell is they talk about a boat ride going up the Amazon. And the Amazon is like, in in some places, a mile or oh, two yeah. wide. I yeah. mean, it's, it's depending on its level. I yeah. mean, it could be, you can't see the other side. Oh, yeah. And, uh. He talks about this uh, boat ride that's through the night, and uh, everybody falls asleep. And then at some point, Jeff wakes up, and the driver's asleep, laying on the motor. Yeah. And they've been for hours going in circles. They've been doing <laughs> large circles in the Amazon, and Jeff notices like that's the village we were at like yeah. four or five <laughs> hours ago. Yeah. So uh, that once again, there is no schedule, and and that's part, that becomes part. I'm of sure your they all just laughed about it. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, what can you do? They've had uh, um, the the even though the Amazon's that big, in some places it can be pretty crowded. So navigating and it's <laughs> yeah. just all take the same attitude that you have in the rickshaws for survival and oh, apply yeah. it to the boats. Yeah. And whoever's biggest and moving the fastest <laughs> normally has the right of way. Yeah. Um, we all, uh, my fr- first trip, we almost hit a, there was a boat. It was after dark. We were late going to Percy's property. And so we're going up the Amazon. We weren't going really fast. And those pecky peckies, I think is what they're called. Um, and we came up on a boat that was completely blacked out. You know, they didn't have any gas, didn't have any lights. They'd run out of gas. And, um, uh, we, we had some, we were able to, to give to them. Hell them out. Yeah. But it was a load. They were coming from. Um, like a Father's Day celebration or something. A bunch of families in, in the boat. Man, it could have been bad. Yeah, know? yeah. So having your wits about you there is, yeah. is 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 always. I mean, it's good anywhere. Oh, so yeah. that seems to be a big part of that. And uh, 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 do you, what's the outside of Aquitos? Is there a specific area that you go into, or I mean, if people wanted to look it up on a map and see? Yeah. So coming when we come out of the jungle. Uh, one of the final things you do on the last day is build a big um, signal fire. You know, we teach you know, how to build a big signal fire. And then the day before, you, we will have worked on uh, the rafts, uh, the log rafts that you'll see in some of the pictures. Um, and once the signal fire is lit, and when we discuss signaling, we have actually your rafting, it's simulating rafting the civilization. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you learn how to build the raft, and then you actually get to use it going out into the Amazon. You got piranhas pecking at your toes. And nah. <laughs> <laughs> They're there, but um, never had any issues. Um, and then the let that, you know, you're, you'll you see in the pictures rafting down the, the Amazon for, let that go for maybe an hour or so, and then we put load everybody in the boat, and we go to Tom Shiaku. It's a little, it's where Iquitos is a third world city. Tom Shiaku is like a third world town. So it's just a whole lot smaller. Village. Yeah. Village, yeah, and um, but you know we 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 we'll go there. We'll have you know hotel rooms lined up. Once again, not like you're thinking hotel rooms, but and then uh, we'll go there and get cleaned up. They have showers. Uh, it's probably we're it's, doing showers with air quotes. Yeah, it's probably straight Amazon River water coming out of it. But hey, you can, there's soap. You can get cleaned up, take a shower, get out of those nasty clothes you've had on all week. Uh, put them in a trash bag. Put them in a trash bag, tied up. Do you yeah. normally bring those clothes back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does uh, he ever get the stink out of them? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the, when you get home and you open your luggage up and pull that trash bag out and open it up to wash it, you know, you better hold your breath. <laughs> uh, do you have an issue with people bringing back parasites or anything? Um, um, Giardia. That's what I'm thinking. 
Uh, well, you know, you're allowed a, a water filter. Um, what I, water filter do you bring? I usually bring um, a Katahdin uh, hiker. Okay. And I usually bring an extra filter because... There's so much sediment in the yeah, water. Um, you, you don't want that to clog up and you not have you know, another means with you. Uh, as far as getting sick, uh, Reza, uh, our friend, mine and Ruben's buddy, one trip he went, he got something, and we don't know if it was from processing one of the chickens or he was also big into reptiles, so he was handling uh, one of the snakes quite a bit and uh, caught some kind of stomach bug um, or the salmonella or, or what it was. And um, We get that going to our favorite Mexican yeah. <laughs> restaurant in Atala, so there's a 1 in 10 chance that uh, somebody's going to get it. Um, parting shots anything you can think about funny stories um, something memory wise that sticks out to you yeah my first trip down there um, you done all kinds of hiking camping survival stuff here and then go to the Amazon and um, it's an eye opener you know I remember day two day three having just a brief moment of have I gone too far you know is it this is this is pretty miserable and I know this isn't doing a lot to convince people to take the class but that's part of it you know it's a it's an eye opener well we also know that this class is not for everybody yeah it's not so I think just like field survival letting people know what they're getting into Mm -hmm. eliminates some of that uh yeah making sure you got the right people in the right class one big thing um I wouldn't be worried about if you're not very experienced or haven't done a lot one of the students in one of the classes went down there uh had never even camped overnight he never spent a night outdoors never camped never done anything and i told him i said you're, you're jumping in it with both feet um but you don't have any preconceived notions or bad habits or this is the way i always did it you know you, you, it's coming in with a clean slate the good news is every trip after this will be easier <laughs> oh yeah and uh man he, he did fine you know he had a rough first night because he um we kept telling him on the swamp bed it needed to be part of it needed to be reinforced and and he didn't take the time to do that and so that next morning um, going around checking on everybody and he was sitting on the ground with his mosquito net wrapped around him and uh, his, his swamp bed had collapsed. So, but he learned, you know, learned from your mistakes. That's what Bruce and I always harp on. You know, we're not, we don't do what we don't get to do what we do because we're experts. Uh, you learn from your mistakes and we've made tons of them. You yeah. know, and that's, a, you know, what it's all about. Go ahead and finish your story. You're talking about um, just prior to that. Uh, which one? Help me out. You can cut this. My my phone's going nuts. Uh, what was it? What were you just talking about? Oh, about I was talking about the first trip down there. And, yeah, and day two or day three, having a moment of yeah, maybe I'm in too deep. Yeah, yeah, and that that's it. You know, it went away. What was what was that? Uh, what got you there? So, for me, I've always had to, I've had issues with staying hydrated enough. Uh, I've only had to, you know gone to the ER once, you know, for dehydration, uh, but that was in the back of my head. So my first trip to the jungle, I thought I'm thinking I've got to stay hydrated. I got to keep slamming water, or I'm gonna get run down. Well, we weren't eating. You know, didn't have any. You know, didn't have any salts, electrolytes, anything like that. It was just straight water. And by t- day two and day three, around that time, I was tanked. I mean, I was just... Is that hypernatremia? Yeah, hypernatremia. And, um, I, you, but you still think you're dehydrated because of how you feel. You right. know, I, I just feel like my body's wrecked, you know, uh, feeling sick to my stomach, just really having a tough time. And um, Jeff gave me some oral rehydration salt, mixed it up in an algae, told me to sip it, you know, slowly sip it for the next couple hours. It was like a light switch. I was, oh, okay. You know, I'm fine now. So that was a big part of it. You know, this, you know, this is the environment kicking my butt is what was, you know, what I was thinking, but it was really me kicking my own butt by chugging water. Or cooperating with the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but after that, fine. And, um, you know, another thing that I've taken, um, like little potassium tablets, uh, take one of you know, one of those a day, uh, just to keep from cramps, you know, a lot of times people get dehydrated, start getting muscle cramps and stuff. So, I think most of this is just, uh, you know, like we've said before, is you got to learn to be comfortable, like learn to get comfortable in uncomfortable oh, yeah. situations. And if if you can willingly put yourself in 
bad situations mm-hmm. that are under, in a controlled environment should that one day you find yourself in a bad situation that's out of your control mm-hmm. then you will have a measure of control and a measure of experience oh yeah as far as how to navigate your way out of that yeah. mentally and physically that's something else ruben and i joke about the only thing we're experts in is suffering suffering <laughs> yeah so but you know one thing we always stress in field survival is that positive mental attitude oh, yeah. and to be if you can be down there with uh folks that cracking you know it, it sucks it, it, i mean it's hard mm-hmm. e- either way but it's it's hard, but it's better if you're laughing oh, yeah. versus if you're down there as a wet blanket, more yeah. or less, and, and you just get into the doldrums. And where, we, where we, you know, all the swamp beds will be built, and you can't just, you know, 6 o'clock at night, who's ready to go? Who, besides Jeff, who goes to bed at 6 o'clock at night? Right, right. But, of course, uh, he's up at 4 in the morning, too. <laughs> so there's hours of just, you, you're within earshot of each other. So it's stories jokes yeah. i imagine it's a lot like uh it, i kind of think of it as like that blazing saddles <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's just a lot of cutting up till finally people start dozing off and and um just a lot of fun 